maintaining the recording. Okay, there we go. All right, so we are going to work on this lab today. You know, I have not released it yet, so you guys cannot see it just yet. Um, but the notes related to base conversion is right here. All right, so in the notes that we talked about on last Wednesday, I hope you guys you had a chance to read the material because you know, it is really essential that you read the material and take notes um, when you're reading it. So there are two equations that are particularly useful. Uh, one is this equation here, and the other one is the equation here. So I'm just gonna be lazy and ask, do you guys have any questions instead of having me, having me to re-explain those two equations? So are there any questions about what those equations are and what they do? You know, what is the purpose of those equations? Okay, I'll just ask a quick question then. Which one is for converting a value into a particular base and which one is for figuring out what is the value represented by a particular number in a particular base? You can just refer to the top one versus the bottom one. So which one is for converting a value into a number in a particular base? Yep, go ahead. The bottom one, the bottom one very good. So that leaves the, up the top one to be the one that you use in order to figure out what is the value represented by a number in a particular base. Very good. So um, if you think that you may not remember this in about an hour and a half, write it down because you're gonna need it to do the lab. Okay, since I'm not seeing a lot of people writing anything down, I'm assuming that you kind of get this already, which is good, okay? That's what I'm really hoping for, is you guys have already studied this material and you understand the material. All right, so that's one. Um, if I go back to my announcements, I just made a, an announcement today in the morning, um, because from the Tuesday, Thursday class, I found that some people do not know all the math that is necessary to do base conversion. So if you think that you may not fully understand what is exponent and you know the terms in the division, like which part is the remainder, which one is the which part is the quotient, you might want to read this first before you try the lab. Okay? Because you know this one, okay, I can show you what it looks like. It is uh, generated by Chat GPT. The prompt is me asking Chat GPT to give me a quick tutorial on the math concepts, specifically exponents, the sigma notation, and also you know, all the terms related to division. So if you need a little refresher with those terms, you are more than welcome to read this whole thing, which is AI generated, but I made a prompt, okay? So I basically identified what people were not fully understanding and then just asked you know, ChatGPT to present a quick tutorial of just those few concepts because I don't want anyone to have to go back and take Algebra 2 as a result, because that's gonna be what, a three unit class? Okay, this one, you know, it's hopefully it is just a quick thing. Any questions at this point? No questions? Okay, all right. So we are proceeding with um, binary addition and subtraction. Let me show you where to find that first. So I'm gonna view this as a student, so this way the screen resembles what you would be seeing normally. So basically we are just going down the list and you know, below this one is binary addition and subtraction. That's what we'll be talking about. So typically if you want to read ahead of the class, you just move down the list, you just keep reading, okay? And that is actually quite important that you read ahead of the class. To illustrate binary addition and subtraction, um, I can either use the tablet or I can use a text editor to kind of illustrate. So I will go ahead and use a text editor in this class to illustrate bi not just binary, but base 10 addition and subtraction. And then we will transition to the pattern and then we'll transition to the overall pattern for any base. And then we'll transition to you know, what we can do with base two. So that's gonna be the roadmap of, of what we are doing today. Uh, that's not, okay, 
Let me start up notepad or mouse pad. There we go. Excellent. So I'm going to give you a certain base 10 subtraction. There's one example presented in the notes already, but we can always use a different one. So let's start with 267, and we are going to add to it. Okay, I need maybe one more space here. We'll add to it, um, let's see, 736. There we go. All right. So the first question is, do you know how to carry out this multi-digit addition in base 10 by hand? In other words, if I just give you some time, you have a piece of paper, can you work this out? Okay, excellent. So what we're gonna do is going like, okay, but I have a different representation than what you, you would normally use on a piece of paper. Okay, so that's a little bit different. So what I do is I define this row here. So I, I will start to name the, the different rows. This is row X, this is row Y. In other words, X and Y are really just the numbers that we are trying to add together. We're trying to figure out the sum of X and Y. But I'm getting a particular row here, which is what I call the single digit sum of the digits of X and Y. So the first question is, what exactly is seven plus six? The most normal or the most common answer to that question is it is 13, right? But 13 is not going to be very helpful here because 13 as a quantity cannot be represented by a single digit in base 10. So now I have to figure out, okay, if I cannot represent 13 as a single digit, what, uh, what do I need to break it up into? And some of you will go like, well, since 13 is greater than or equal to 10, maybe we can just have a carry of one to the digit to the left-hand side of the column that we are working with to kind of indicate that, oh, this quantity, I cannot take care of the entire thing myself. Why don't you take care of the 10 of the 13, and I'll take care of what is remaining, which is the three. Does that make sense? Okay, those are the reasons why we have carry and why we have what, we, what I call a single digit sum, which is the three, the single three in this case. So the row Q is really just a single digit sum of adding the digits of X and Y. So this one is just a nine, and this one is a nine as well. Then you guys are going like, what about the carries? Well, the carries have their own role, okay? So I'm representing the single digit sum and the carry on different rows. So this is where the normal notation is different from you know, what I use here, okay? So this carry row, I call it K, you know, because C is used as a function name that we'll see later on. And then the final result is row S for sum. So now we go back and then we say, what about K zero? Is there a carry of one or carry of zero to column zero? The answer is it's gonna be a zero because we don't have any um, actual addition prior to this particular column. So this one is a zero. But then the next question is, what about this one here? Do we have any carry or is the carry to column one a one or a zero? What do you guys think? It's a one because that one is coming from the seven plus the six, ending up with a quantity that is greater than or equal to 10. So we have a carry of one over here. What about this one over here? What should go here? Zero. It is a one. The reason why it is a one is not because six plus, plus three is greater than or equal to 10, but it is because nine plus one is greater than or equal to 10. In other words, a carry of one from a previous column can come from two different sources. It can be coming from X plus Y. It can also be come from coming from Q plus K. Is that okay? Okay. It is not any different from the normal way that you carry out multi-digit addition. I just put the carry on its own row. That is the only notational difference compared to how you normally get things done. Is that okay so far? All right, so I put a one here. What about this position here? Do I have a one or a zero? There's a one, that's right, that is correct. 
because even though 2 plus 7 is not greater than or equal to 10, because that's just 9, the 9 plus this one here is 10, and 10 is greater than or equal to 10, and that means that we have a carry of 1 over here. Are we still doing okay so far with this notation? Okay, all right, I'm seeing a bunch of nods. Okay, so now the question is, what about the sum? Well, the sum is really just a single digit um, sum between the Q and the K. So we look at 3 plus 0, which is a 3. Okay, that's an easy one. We look at the 9 plus 1. The single digit sum of 9 plus 1 is 0. Very good. Because 9 plus 1 is a 10, so I need to have a carry of 1. That carry of 1 takes care of 10. Well, but the original value was 10 to begin with, so once you take care of the 10, there's zero left over as the single digit sum. And then over here, it's the same deal. Nine plus one has a single digit sum of zero, and that's it. I don't even bother to put the digit here. That is because inside a computer, this, the, the two numbers that you're adding along with the sum, they all need to have exactly the same number of digits. Your sum cannot have, oh, I'm, I'm, I think I might need an extra digit to take care of the quantity. It doesn't happen that way. So the two numbers that you're adding, as well as the sum, they must have exactly the same number of digits. Then somebody may say, but then the result is wrong because you're know, adding 267 and 736 is now just three. Well, that is not exactly the entire thing either because we did have an overall carry of one. And because that carry of one is a digit three, so can someone tell me you know, what does digit three do in a base 10 number? It is the quantity of 10 to the power of, the digit position has to do with the digit being a quantity of 10 to the power of that position. And since this is position three, so that means the one that is being highlighted is indicating that it's one of 10 to the power of three, because it is digit three. So that's a thousand, right? So if you look at this carry of one, the overall carry of one, indicating that, oh, by the way, we have a carry of one, which is a thousand, okay, because of the position of that one, combined with the three as the actual result, which is zero, zero, three, 1,000 plus 3 is 1,003, which is the proper answer. Are we doing okay so far with the concept? Okay, even though this is something that you are familiar with, multi-digit base 10 addition, are we okay with the terms that I'm using here? Particularly what is a single digit sum and what is the carry and the reason why they exist. We good? Okay. Then the next thing we do is we look at this and go like, hmm, okay, let me just try to make a function to compute the single digit sum. So I'm gonna call this you know, R of U, V. U is a single digit, V is also a single digit. And R of U, V, U, V is really try trying to compute the single digit sum between U and V. And we'll just say that this is all in base 10. Okay, so we are not gonna work with other bases, it's just base 10. So can someone come up with a way to compute R of UV given this particular example, given that you know, the uh, single digit sum between seven and six is a three, the single digit sum between six and three is a nine, and the single digit sum between a nine and a one is a zero. Can you generalize and give me a function to do this? Yes, go ahead. Mod by 10. So you mod the sum by 10, right? Yeah. Mod okay. Mod yep, that will do the trick. Very good. Well, the first thing we want to do is to double check it, right? So we want to double check and ask um, three plus seven plus six is 13. 13 mod 10 is indeed a three. Three plus zero is three. 3 mod 10 is definitely a 3. 6 plus 3 is a 9. 
9 mod 10 is 9. Okay, working so far, you know, up to here. 9 plus 1 is 10. 10 mod 10 is a 0. So it looks like it's working just fine. Okay, excellent. What about the carry? So if I were to add two single digits, okay, u and v once again are single digits, and I want to, I want the function to tell me whether there's a carry of one or a carry of zero, what would that look like? If you want to use a conditional statement to begin with, that's fine, okay, but the question is, how do we know whether there's a carry of one or a carry of zero? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so you're basically saying you have one um, only uh, if and only if um, uh, u plus v is greater than or equal to 10, and then you can say zero otherwise. Is that kind of what you're suggesting? Okay, excellent. That is correct. But, you know, this is a kind of long way to say you know, this thing when we have a much handier way to say the same thing using what we call the ternary operator in C and C++. So I will introduce the ternary operator because in this semester, I am going to use the ternary ex ex operator a lot. Okay, It is not one of the most common thing that people teach you to use in C++, in CISP 360, but I use it a lot because it is a very concise way of expressing something. So I'm going to use that which is basically you, okay, I'm, I'm gonna use extra parentheses that are not really needed. So this is a condition, it's either true or false. The question mark is um, whatever is immediately to the right-hand side of the question mark is the value of the expression if and only if the condition to the left of the question mark is true. So in this case, oh, okay, well, in that case, it's just a one. And then in the else case, which means so whatever is immediately to the right-hand side of the colon is the value of the entire expression if and only if the condition is false. If the condition is false, I just want to specify a zero for the entire thing. So this is what we call a ternary expression, which is essentially an if-then-else in a single expression. Do we have any questions about the if-then-else or the ternary expression itself? Okay, we're good with that, okay? So that is how we define R and that's how we define C. So now we start to relate the digits together. So I'm gonna add one additional row here that indicates the, uh, the digit number. This is digit three, this is digit two, this is digit one, this is digit zero. So I'm just gonna say this is, you know, this particular row, all it does is to indicate the digit position. Is that okay? So let's see what are what we are given with. So we are given with uh, x. I'm going to use um, I, I. If I can, I use a subscript. But since I cannot use a subscript in a text editor, so I'm just going to say x zero, x one, x two, y zero, y one, y two. I mean that's just the two numbers that we're supposed to add. We are usually given k zero as well, which is usually just zero but I'm gonna throw it in as you know, one of the things that we are given with. And what we want to do is to compute, eventually we want to compute S0, S1, S2, because that's the sum, okay? This is, that's actually what we want to compute, but we also want to compute K3, which is the overall carry of the entire operation. The overall carry of the entire operation is really asking, is three digits enough to store the sum. If it is not enough, then K3 as an overall carry is gonna be a one. If it is enough, then K3 is gonna be a zero because three digits is all we need or, or is all we need to represent the sum. So the K3 is significant because it tells us whether you know the actual result fits in the three digits that we have for the sum itself. All right, so I'm gonna Pause a little bit here and see if you guys have any questions. Any questions about the nomenclature? X zero is bit zero of, I mean, digit zero of X. 
uh, y2 is digit 2 of y, and so on. Because that notation or the concept of accessing individual digits of a number, that was something that we talked about on last Wednesday. So do we have any qu questions about the nomenclature, which means how we name things? No questions? All right. So if there are no questions, then we go like, okay, I really want to relate you know, the Q to the X and Y. I want to relate the S to Q and K. And I want to relate the K to X, Y, Q, K of the previous column. That's the next thing I want to do. So let's start with the easier ones. So QI, which is bit uh, digit I of Q, um, given this is all we have at this point, can someone tell me how we can compute the digit I of Q? What does it rely on? What do you think it relies on? What are the two things that Q of, okay, we'll, we'll, pick, we'll hand pick one, okay? So this is Q of zero. The computation of Q of zero relies on what? Yep. X zero, X zero, zero Y zero. Y Very good. Okay, so we know that this somehow makes use of X I, Y I. Okay, basically it uses the X and Y of the same column. Is that okay? The question is, um, what do we do with those two digits of the same column? There is a reason why we have the R and the C function. Which one do we use in this case? R. R, very good, nice. Okay, so we now know that R of X, I, Y, I will give us Q of I. Okay, excellent. Uh, what about S? S of I, what, did, what does it rely on? So we're looking at this three here, we're looking at this zero here. Um, what, do you, what does it rely on? The sum of? Um, it relies on, you have Q and K, okay? Very good, because we want to name the digits based on the row. So this one relies on Q, K of the same column. So once again, we ask, well, we know it relies on those two things, but how do we use those two things to compute S of I? R, very good, excellent. So we say, okay, this is th also the R function applied to Q, K of the same column. Are we do okay so far? All right. So now we only have one left. And this is the harder one, k of i plus 1. So k of i plus 1 relies on the digits from the previous column. When I say previous, I mean immediately to the right-hand side. So that would be what? Okay, let's, let's take a look. If you look at this one here, okay, this particular one here, um, how do we get that one? It's because of... Name, name the digits, okay? You know, is it because of Y1 or Y0 or Q1 or Q0? Tell me which one. Say that one more time. Uh-huh. Okay, so, so you're correct. But name the column. Which X and which Y? Once you generate. Once we generalize, yes, okay, so X, I, Y, I are what we need, okay, and, but how do we come up, now we know what is involved. The question now is, um, what do we do with X, I, Y, I in order to come up with K of I plus one? Yep, function C applied to that thing, very good. But then we go like, wait, hold on a second here, sometimes there's something else. In other words, when you look at this particular one here, how did we get? How did we end up with the one here? The Q and the K of the previous column, right? So now we go like, oh, okay. So there's one more component here, because the Q I K I fed to the carry function. 
is the other way that we can end up with a carry of 1 in a particular column. All right, so I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions about all of this, okay? Because what I have done so far, let me just kind of give you the roadmap again, you know, how did we get here? I gave you a normal, more or less, you know, base 10 addition, and then I start to name the rows, x, y, q, k, s, and then by illustration, by, you know, a, an example, I show you what I mean when I say a single digit sum and also a single digit sum, and I also illustrated by hand how we computed the carry for each column in the original calculation. And this is all in base 10, which basically means this is a very awkward way to do something that you are already familiar with. Are we good with that? Okay. So the naming, which is x, y, q, k, s, gives us a, uh, a mechanism to name every single digit. Because I don't want to learn just how to perform this specific multi-digit addition. I want to figure out the pattern of how do we perform multi-digit addition in general. So, but we also realize that single digit sum is you know, this function here. And the way we determine whether we have a carry of one or a carry of zero just using two digits is to use this particular equation here, this function here. So once we have all of those things, then we go like, hmm, we, what are the inputs? The inputs are the digits of x, the digits of y, and the digit of k0. Those are the, all the inputs. What we really want to compute are the digits for the sum and also you know, the overall carry of the entire operation. Those are the objective of what we want to accomplish. But in order to do that, we have to go like, um, so how do we figure out all the cues? Well, turns out you know, this is how we compute all the cues. How do we figure out all the sum of you know, the S bits? This is how we figure out all the sum bits. And how do we calculate all the Ks, the carry bits, you know, these guys? And it's, as it turns out, this is how we compute all the carry bits. Are we doing okay so far with the progression, starting with a concrete example in base 10, observing what, how we do it by hand, kind of look into you know, what is a single digit sum and what is a carry, what do they mean and when do we use it, and then generalizing everything into this form. So are we good with this? All right. Yes. Could you explain the left hand again? Can I explain? The left hand. The left. The last. The last. Yeah. Because this one. This one is because of x zero plus y zero is greater than or equal to ten, but this one here is because of q one plus k1 is exactly 10, which is also greater than or equal to 10. So there are two mechanisms or two sources to contribute to a one to a carry. That's what, you know, try, that's what this particular thing is trying to capture. Huh? What? Yes, because of the column. Because this, uh, this one here, the one that's highlighted, is digit two, but it relies on digit one of the previous column mm -hmm. to do the computation. That's why you know, it is k of i plus 1. This is basically the digit position. I cannot use a subscript uh, when I'm doing re using a regular text uh, editor. So instead of subscript i plus 1, I use the you know, square bracket to indicate I'm only concerned about digit i plus 1. All right, very good. So the next question is, what if we are not dealing with base 10? What are we going to do? Well, do you think that the structure of multi-digit addition is going to change because we want to sh sh uh, change to a different base? Nope, the structure stays the same. So the only thing that makes this entire thing specific to base 10 is the mentioning of 10 of this entire block. So if you look at this entire block, every everywhere we see 10, we just say, oh, okay, whatever base it is, just change this to that base. And also right here, if we change to use some other base, change that 10 to whatever base we are using, and that's it. In other words, the entire structure stays exactly the same. 
This is the reason why we extract the structure, because we want to know what is actually the mechanism that we are using to compute the sum of two numbers. Once we know the mechanism in base 10, then we can generalize and go like, oh, okay, if this is just a general mechanism, then we just have to do something like this, okay? So I'm gonna illustrate this. You don't have to copy this because you cannot <laughs> copy and paste handwriting. So all we need to do is to change, okay, let me, so to generalize to base B, all we have to do is to say everywhere we see 10, we say, oh, whatever B is, we just use B. So what can B be? It can be eight for base eight. It can be 16 for base 16. We'll, do, we'll deal with base 16 a little bit later. It can be seven if we want to use a very strange base. Okay, who would use base seven, right? Except for drunk octopi. <coughs> Is that okay so far? All right. So now we go like, hmm, but things inside the computer are mostly base two, or they're all base two because everything is either a voltage that is beyond the high, higher than a threshold or lower than a threshold, and you know, everything that's lower than a certain threshold is a zero, and everything that's above a certain threshold is a one. So we only got zeros and ones in the computer, which means it is using what base? Base two, otherwise known as binary, right? So now we say, what about base two? What about base two addition? Well, that's an easy question to answer. All we need to do is to say, oh, B equals to two, and everything works out. Is that okay? So I'm gonna copy and paste again. Obviously, you don't have to do the same thing because you know, the notes actually has everything. If you read the notes before the class, then you basically have all, the, all of this stuff already. All right, so all we have to do is to say, oh, wherever B is, we just change it to a two. That seems pretty easy, right? But we still have a problem because even though, you know, using this portion here, we know exactly how to carry out a base two addition. The problem is it still involves addition. It still involves mod, which is you know, basically a uh, division. We still have addition. We have comparison and all that stuff. And all I really want to do is to figure out you know, how to do this using transistors because you know, that's all we have inside the computer. Okay, That's the only mechanism that we have inside a computer, a transistor. So we want to use transistors to do everything. So I cannot really answer the question of how to use transistors to perform addition when, ad when addition is involved in the calculation of addition. Okay, I'm not sure whether you guys are getting my point or not. Hey, there's an addition here, there's another addition here. And all I want to do is to figure out how to do addition. Uh, that's kind of circular reasoning, right? It doesn't work. So what we need to do is to go like, hmm, I wonder in base two, is there another way to perform these calculations, but without using addition, division, or comparison? Is that okay? Is everybody kind of following the, the rationale? Because I think the rationale is just as important as the result of the derivation. Because once you understand the rationale, you know why we are doing this. And sometimes that is actually more important than how we are doing it. Understanding the what is important, but the why is also very important. All right, so let's go ahead and see what happens, okay? So I'm gonna give you a table. Um, we have x, okay, we have u and v, and then the r of u, v, but for base two. So normally I would not do something like this because for base 10, it's gonna have how many rows? In base 10, u can go from zero to nine, right? But for every value of u, v can also range from zero to nine. So for base 10, how many rows are we gonna end up with? A hundred, that is correct, because it's 10 times 10. But for base two, how many rows do we end up with? Four, very good, because it's two times two. Because u only has two possible values, zero or one. For each value of u, 
v can also be a 0 or 1, so it's 2 times 2, 4. I think 4 is, a, is far more manageable compared to 100. Yes? Okay? So that's what we're going to do. So u can be 0, v can be 0. So in that case, in base 2, what is u of uh, r of uv? What is the single digit sum of 0 plus 0? Yep, you don't even have to look up the definition of r because what do you get when you, you, when you have 0 plus 0? <laughs> Pretty clearly a 0. What about 0 plus 1? I think it doesn't matter what base we're dealing with, right? On one hand, you have nothing. On the other hand, you have 1. And when you try to add up all the quantities, you have what? Just 1. Okay. And then 1 plus 0 is also having a single digit sum of 1. This is the only one that is tricky. 1 plus 1. Okay. So for this one, you do have to plug it back into the formula or the definition of the function. You go like 1 plus 1 is a 2. 2 mar 2 is 0. So that is the only one that is a little bit tricky. The other three rows are like pretty easy. Are we doing okay so far with this table? All right. And then we'll do another one for uh, carry. Okay, same kind of deal. So this time we are computing C of UV instead of R of UV. Okay, my watch is buzzing me, so that means it's time to take row. So I'm going to switch gear, take row first, and then come back to this module. All right, so let me go back to modules, and I have to leave student view because you know, the rotating activity is not visible yet. All right. Today is the nine. Uh, th today is the fourth of September, so it would be this one. So I'm making it visible right now, and I click on it so that you guys can see the access code. So the access code is sigma, S-I-G-M-A, or lowercase. I'll write, I'll write it on the whiteboard just so that people can see it. And I can move on with the notes. All right. Can I zoom in on? Uh, it's sigma, S-I-G-M-A, or lowercase. It's also on the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And sigma is, you know, the symbol for summation. You know, the summation, you know, symbol is called sigma. All right, so we're gonna go back to the notes here, okay? All right, so same deal, right? You know, U can be a zero, and while U is a zero, V can be a zero. While U is still a zero, V can be a one, and then we have one, zero, and then one, one. And what is the carry of zero plus zero? Does it necessitate a carry of one in base two? Nope. Okay, so we have, we have a carry of zero. What about zero plus one? Is the result of zero plus one more than what a base two no digit can rep can represent? Nope. Okay, another zero. This is symmetric, so that's a zero two. So the only time that you have to kind of think about it a little bit is one plus one, because one plus one is two. The quantity of two cannot be represented by a single digit in base two. So that's the only time that we have a carry of one. Are we doing okay so far with the two tables here? You know, the first table dealing with um, R of UV and the second table dealing with C of UV, but both are specific to base two. Okay, so that's the important part is this is all in base two. All right, so the next thing is to look at this truth table, the bottom one, and then we ask, that looks awfully familiar. I hope it looks familiar to you because there's one logical operator in C or C++ 
that will give you exactly the same result. Which operator are we talking about? In other words, I'm looking, okay, very good. We're looking at and. So we look, go, we look at this and go like, okay, let me just to be, let, let me just be sure about this. U and V, okay, you know, because we suspect this is gonna work out for us. So we go like, yep, okay, false and false is false. False and true is false. True and false is false. True and true is the only time that we have true. You go like, hmm. Tech, I remember earlier that you said that we want to perform these operations, but without involving actual addition or comparison. I think we just found it. Okay, let me, let me point out what exactly I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is this definition of C, which is specific to base two, is doing exactly the same thing as a logical AND. Are you convinced? So that means, oh, okay, so that means I don't have to go through all this crap of addition and then comparison and then the ternary operator and, and stuff like that. I can just use a logical AND. Does that make sense? It only works in base two, okay? It doesn't work in any other basis because base two only cares about, only has two possible results in a single digit, zero and one. Okay, the other basis, it doesn't work. Okay, so if we can do it like this, what about the R function here? As it turns out, there's one, okay, I'll give you the solution, okay, because it's not easy. So this one is basically not U or not U and V, the whole thing in parentheses, and then we have a or U and not V. So as it turns out, this expression, even though it's a little bit complex, does exactly the same thing, okay? So we want to double check and see whether that works or not. On the first row, both U and V are zeros, so that means both conjunctions are going to be zeros, and zero or zero is a zero. Okay, well, that's easy. The second row has U being false, V being true. So if U is false and V is true, then not u is going to be true, v is also true, then we have true and true. Since you know, this is on one side of a disjunction, that means the whole thing is going to be true. When um, u is true, v is false, then we look at the second part of the disjunction, or the or, because u is already true, that's good. v is false, but here we negate v first. So the negation of false is true, then we end up with true and true again. So on one side of the OR, we have a true. That means the whole OR is going to be true as well for the one here. And over here, both U and V are true, but this conjunction involves the negation of U, which means this conjunction is going to be false. This conjunction involves you know, V, the negation of V, which means it has to be false too. Then we have false or false, which means the entire thing is also false. Okay? You look at this and go like, wait, I think we have another way to compute R, okay? Because this is the way we used to compute R, which works, okay? There's no problem with it, except it involves addition and also division because a mod is basically a division. We just use the other result of a division. So now we go like, oh, so instead of doing this, which is arithmetic operation, we can turn the whole thing into a Boolean operation, okay? What is the significance of turning things into Boolean operations using and or not? Yep. Okay. The result, so zero and one becomes your know, false and true, okay, very good. But from the other perspective of, you know, I want to make things that can perform these computations, from that perspective, what is the significance? What is the whole idea of computer architecture, which is part of the title of this class? Most people just call this class assembly language programming. That is not the case anymore, okay? It also includes computer or processor architecture. So from that perspective, what do you think is important? 
Yes. We have to use transistors. Very good. And we can use transistors to make NAND gates, right? Because that's what we did last Monday. Okay, the very first day we met, we did you know, that experiment. Two P transistors, two N transistors, we can make a NAND gate. And then in the lab of last Wednesday, we used NAND gates to make negation, not gate, and also the AND gate. We know we can do it, we can do, we can make OR gates out of NAND gates too, even though it's not part of the experiment or part of the lab. So we go like, oh, so that means everything here can be done using transistors. This can be done using transistors. This can also be done using transistors. I'm not saying this is going to be an easy circuit or a simple circuit because it has nested not and then an and and then on the outside we have the or. It is going to be a little bit involved. But the question is not how simple it is. The question is, can we do it? The answer is, yes, we can. Okay, that's the important part. We, we got one more problem here. The additional problem has to do with this addition here. Because K of I plus one is not just C of you know, X one, X I, Y I, or just you know, C of Q I, K I. It is the addition of those two. So we still have this addition, which is an arithmetic operation to be concerned about. So now what we do is we look at the you know, U, V again, okay? U, V are just your know, two independent Boolean variables. And we want to look at uh, U or V versus U plus V. In other words, we are asking, uh, they look almost the same except for one little thing, okay? What is the one little thing that makes the logical OR operator different from addition? Yes? Can you uh, speak up a little bit? Uh huh. Because we want to see whether we can replace the addition, which is not what we want to use, by a OR, because that's what we want to use. translating the arithmetic operator into a Boolean operator. But we want to see whether they are different, and if they are different, how are they different? Is that difference going to make any difference? Is that okay? So, um, I'm just going to preach again. It is important to read the modules ahead of time, because you know, in the module, I actually explain this. Now. I know that I, I write in a certain way that is very concise, which means, you know, you know, the first pass, very few people can read my stuff and get everything in the first pass. But it's not intended for a one pass kind of reading either. So that means, you know, the material that I'm giving you, the, the modules that I wrote, those things are intended for multi-pass reading. You read it one pass and go like, okay, I sort of get it, but there are things that I am not connecting, then read it again and see if you can make that connection. Okay, that's kind of, um, I did not know it to begin with. Then people start to tell me, it's like, yeah, now that you explained it, I can see everything is in the module, but the first time I read it, I cannot make all the connections. Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, that works too. But, you know, the bottom line is how many cases do we have? We have four cases. Okay, of the four cases, U or V is going to give us 0, 1, 1, and 1. Right? But the addition is going to give us almost the same thing with only one difference. 0, 1, one and a two. So in base two, in a single digit base two operation, this is the only row that makes a difference. So now the question is, does it matter, okay, that the addition and the disjunction are different when both U and V are ones? But what this translates to is actually not whether U and V are the same, 
we are really asking can C of x i y i is being a one and C of q i k i also be a one at the same time. That really is what we are asking. Because what we are really trying to do is to ask, can we replace this addition with an or? So it has a context. So within that context, what do you think about this scenario? Can they both be ones? We know they can both be zeros, okay? That is not a problem. Can they both be ones? And we want to think about just the binary case because it's a whole lot easier to think about binary. What do you guys think? There are, there are a few ways to show that this is uh, not possible. They cannot both be ones. But in both cases, the trick has to do with Q of I is not an independent variable, which means Q of I can, it, the, the value of Q of I is constrained by x i y i because q of i is defined as a result of calculation using x i y i. Is that okay? So I'll give you a verbal explanation, which is also you know uh, actually written in the notes. Okay, but I'll give you a verbal explanation. So let's just say that this is a one. Okay, p of x i y i is a one. Well, that requires x i y i to be both. Let's look up a little bit earlier. C of something is the conjunction of those two things, right? So in order for the conjunction of x i y i to be a one, what do you think x i y i must be? What is the value of those two? One. They must both be ones. Very good. But if x i y i are both ones, what about q i? Q i is defined to be the r of x i y i. So when both x i y i are ones, what is q of i? Zero. It has to be a zero, right? It has to be a zero. So when one side has the p function, when one of the <coughs> parameter of p is a zero, it doesn't matter what the other one is. The entire c and enti the entire conjunction has to be a. No. <laughs> has to be a zero. You have a 50-50 chance there, right? Because C of something is a conjunction of something. So that means if QI is a zero, then it doesn't matter what KI is. KI can be a one, KI can be a zero. It doesn't matter because the conjunction between this QI and the KI has to be a zero. So what that really means is if both, X, if Q, excuse me, if C of XI, YI is a one, you can guarantee that C of QI, KI has to be a zero. Okay? So that handles one of the two cases. What about the other case? What if I say, hmm, okay, C of Q, I, K, I is a one. Can I also argue that C of X, I, Y, I cannot be a one, it has to be a zero? So let's take a look at that. If C of Q, I, K, I is a one, which is basically a conjunction of Q, I, and K, I is a one, what does that tell me about the value of Q, I, K, I? conjunction of qi ki is one. What does that tell me about the values of Q, qi ki? They're both one. They're both one, very good, okay. If q of i is a one, okay, and you can look down here at the r function, if q of i is a one, what does that tell you about xi, yi? There are only two possible cases. What are those two cases? Let me, let me highlight those two rows. So what I'm talking about are these two rows here, because we know that in this case, QI is a one, okay? Which means you know, X, I, Y, I, they have to be different. One of them has to be a one, and one of them has to be a zero. Does that make sense? Well, if one of them has to be a zero, I don't care which one, the conjunction between these two would have to be, conjunction is an and, so if one of these two is a, is a zero, is guaranteed a zero, I don't care which one, what is the conjunction of these two? Has to be a zero, very good. So that means I, can, I now have 
I've done the mathematical proof. Because what I have just argued is if C of x i y i is a one, then it guarantees that P of Q i K i is a zero because Q i has to be a zero in that case. But I, but I also argued the other way around, which says if C of Q i K i is a one, that means Q i has to be a one. But if Q i is a one, then x i between x i y i, one of them has to be a zero, which means C of x i y i has to be a zero. So I, I have just proven that this case cannot happen. Which means, as far as we are concerned, okay, let me go back to here. Because we know this case cannot happen, we can just pretend that the entire row does not exist. Because it's not going to happen. But if that row is not existing, then we can go like, hey, they give us exactly the same result. We can indeed use logical or instead of arithmetic addition here because the last row can never happen in this particular context. Is that okay? All right, excellent. So what I'm doing in this class and in all of my other classes is I don't really just want to, oh, okay, I'm just looking at my recorder. It's still recording, okay, that's good. Um, I don't want to just give you the result, okay? I don't want to just give you the final result. I want to give you the rationale and the derivation to the result, okay? Because, well, why? Because, you know, I think in industry, they already know all this stuff already, okay? You know, if you just ask your know, Wikipedia or if you ask Open uh, Chat and GPT, they will give you the final form already. You know, why do we bother with the explanation of how to derive the entire thing? What, why, why do you think that part is important? This is a little bit out of the scope of this class, but I think ultimately it is important for you guys to kind of think about it. So why do you think it is important for me to try to get you guys to think and not just to know? Even though all the things, I'm just reinventing the wheel, right? You just, all this stuff is already derived, okay? People have already figured this out. I'm just explaining to you guys how it is derived. So why is that important? Go ahead. But in return, why is that important? What you said. Well, but why, why is that important? Why is it important for you to be able to solve problems you know, at a lower level? Uh, well, we were always discussing about where you can solve it as an analytical problem. Um, so um, it has to do with, yes, okay. speed. So you're talking about optimization. optimization. So you're talking about optimization where if you understand how things work at a lower level, then you can do optimization and make your code go faster. Well, I, I hate to burst your bubble. <laughs> the uh, optimizer that is built into the C compiler typically does a better job than the best programmers. So it will look at your code and go like, oh, I can rearrange things a little bit internally it will give you the same result, but it's going to be faster. And the, the optimizer of a compiler typically can outperform a, you know, even a high-level program. So, so what, you, what you said, you know, it, it makes sense, okay? You know, but you know, the tools that we have are so advanced that you know, even that is, the machine can do a better job. So there's that too. So the main reason is AI, okay? So how does AI impact your life up to this point and what do you think it's gonna do 
by the time you're ready to go out to look for a job. Yes. You're talking about you know, kind of being able to figure out the details, to figure it out in order to, I'm saying it's like, look, if I'm at a point where I can do my calculus, I'm just like, bye. Mm-hmm. I'm done. I mean, shit, we're in a pretty good place. In the sense that, you know, you're in college. <laughs> uh, there's, there's obviously that whole perspective of like, oh, shit, I don't know what to do. Um, mm-hmm. uh, overall, if you have this low level of understanding, if you understand anything, you can teach it to anyone. Okay, so let's let's flip that perspective around okay. and look at it from the perspective of the people who want to hire someone. Absolutely. So we are looking. So you're looking at the people across the table when you're interviewing for a job. You're the interviewee, and we are trying to pretend to be the interviewer. Say the company is trying to hire people. Why do they want to hire you? Yes. a month as a subscription, if the employer can just ask the AI, like, this is the program that I need you to write and I, I need, you know, to describe the whole thing, and pop, you know, and, and here goes, okay, the program in Python or in Kotlin or in whatever programming language that the employer wants. Would the employer want to hire people? Does, doesn't matter whether it's you or me, okay? No, the answer is no, okay? If, the, if AI can do the job, you know, um, the employer does not want to hire a person to do the same thing. So, where do you think AI can do? so what do you think the a- exactly? So the question is, what do you think AI cannot do that a good you know a person who is who has the expertise can still do? Can, can still do a better job? I'll show you something. Okay, yeah, I'll show you something, and you guys will go like, oh, so that is why you mentioned that. So give me a second here. Let me switch back to this module. Okay. I asked your chat GPT to come up with some exercises for this module. It came up with a bunch of questions and also the answers, except the answers were wrong. (laughs) So the AI is not 100%. uh, It can do a pretty good job on a lot of things. But at the same time, there are times when it cannot give you the correct result. Okay, so if my level of understanding of this material is only at the same level as the AI, I wouldn't be able to catch the answers generated by chat GPT and go like, oh, that is wrong, let me fix that. Does that make sense? So the same thing applies when you are a developer. Can you ask chat GPT to give you at least the baseline of the code? Yes, you can. But do we know whether that code is gonna work 100%? So you should always have doubt, okay? Even if it's written by a person, you should always have doubt and go like, how can I test this code to make sure that it works 100%? That is the first thing that you need to do. And that is already something that AI cannot yet do. By the time you graduate and get your bachelor's degree in computer science, that's gonna be how many years later? Two years for some of you, maybe three for some of you, right? How many iterations do you think ChatGPT is going to revise itself in those in that amount of time? ChatGPT was released in about two years ago, and that was version 3.5. And then we move on to 4, and now we're using 4.0, okay? Which is slightly enhanced in version 4. Version 5 is being used or being tested um, you know, with the government, with the military branch, you know, that should scare all of us. And I'm not kidding you. you know, that really should scare all of us, okay? Um, so that means, you know, by the time you get your degree in computer science, it'll be version 6, version 7, okay? Um, the amount of hardware that is available to do all the AI training and calculations would also change by the time you graduate because there's such a thing called Moore's Law, M-O-O-R-E, Moore. What does, what did, what, what does it say? What does Moore, lo- Moore's Law say? Give me the class. Okay, so at the very core, Moore's Law has to do with the size of computers. 
So what it says is the size of transistors is shrink by 50% in half every 18 months. Mm -hmm. And the size of the transistor is roughly correlated with the speed. Okay, I mean, the that is, that is roughly. So that means, so even if it's not 18 months, you know, because now I think they changed the Moore's law constant to 24 months, which is two years. So in two years, the transistor density of chip is going to double, which means for the same amount of energy, it can perform twice as much calculation. For the same amount of money, it can store twice the amount of information and data. So you can kind of imagine that you know, AI that is trained two years from now will be quite capable, more capable than the AI that we have today. Because you know, the, there, are certain, there are a few parameters that dictate you know, how much AI can do and cannot do. Um, some of that has to do with the number of parameters, which is already in the billions today. And the other one is how much data is presented to the AI for training purposes, which is already in the terabyte you know, region. So if both of those are doubled, you can basically say that you, know, you, can, you can speculate that AI in two years would be significantly better than AI today. The mistakes that we made you know, when generating the answers to these questions may not, they may not make those mistakes anymore in two years. So that's kind of the trajectory from the perspective of the technology. So what you guys need to keep in mind is how can I beat AI? What can I do that AI cannot do? And for that purpose alone, I think it is important for you guys to experiment with AI. Um, I have, you know, I can include all the AI prompts, you know, chat GPT prompts, so you can see exactly how I generate certain content based on my own content, okay? But I think that is one important thing that, you know, you want to at least keep an eye on throughout your education, you know, so that you know what is going on in industry and what you're competing with. Because you're not just competing with other people, you're competing with technology that is capable of quote unquote thinking. Okay, so that's my piece. I know it's using up you know, some of the class time, but I think it is important to talk about this. Yep. Isn't it important to sort of look at each generative uh, process in some ways? I mean, like when we're talking about AI, mm -hmm. especially in regards to ChatGPT, we're probably talking about how many millions of dollars it's going to be. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're so massive. Yeah. Yeah, the amount of energy that is required for training is so massive that AI is going to use about 8% of the national energy production of the United States. Yep. Right. And again, the only reason I mention it is because like, I've seen like you know, AI learning to like stand there and like just kind of like. It can. Yeah. Like, uh, I've used the Google released a demo speed model for mm -hmm. 27 billion things, right? And it learns based upon like, you know, like full speed. Uh, and but that's after it's trained. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly my point. Yeah. I'm saying is like, it seems like after training, it, 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 it came down to this, it would be more efficient to have this model that just sits in training and, mm -hmm. and just run it on its own. That is correct. So GPT, yeah, go ahead. Content that we generate, okay? Those are all human-generated content. So 
the there are a lot there's a lot of speculatory interest in AI industry that they don't want people to know. One has to do with the amount of the massive amount of human power that is needed just to filter the content that you present to the AI that generates that content. If you just take all the tweets of people and use that to train you know, the AI, it will only be able to cheat. It, they, it won't be able to solve problems. It will only be able to respond like a person to another tweet. That's all it would do. Like, not like, you suck, okay, love it. That's all it's going to be able to do. But on the other hand, if you filter the content and say like, okay, this piece of Wikipedia page is really a great introduction to some content in China, okay, that's a good Then you go like, oh, okay, so if you keep giving AI quality content that is already authored by people, then it can learn that path. It's a very good imitation mechanism, but at least at this point, it cannot do it on human. So that is one of the uh, one of the reasons why you know it might plateau at a certain point because you know there's only so much your human content that you can feed it with, and everything that you feed it with is either words or pictures or videos. You cannot share with AI how you think because the way people think. You might think that you think in words. That is actually not true. Because there are occasions, I think some of you probably have experienced this, if you know the answer, if somebody asks you a question, you know the answer, you know what you want to express, but it takes you some time to turn those concepts, ideas, into words. That is a clear indication that you do not really think in words, in tokens, in so to speak. But all AI can do, all generative AI can do, is to think in tokens, in pictures, in pictures, videos, and so on. So the internal representation of how we think is actually not being captured. So until you know, uh, Elon Musk you know, starts to do implants in our brain to capture the thinking process and also you know, try to replicate that process, I think that it will hit a, will hit a certain plateau. And you mentioned something about you know, a downturn even from the threshold. It's going to happen when AI gets trained with content that is also generated by AI. Okay, that, that's, it's already happening. It's already happening because when that happens, then you are looking at the artifact that is, you're looking basically at artifacts that really should not be there. But the, a, it, the AI is not becoming any smarter when it's trained on things that it itself generates. Well, yeah, that's yeah. why, so this is the reason why NVIDIA is a $3 trillion company, because everybody needs their chip. There are two constraints, two physical constraints to how fast we can move in AI. One has to do with the chip. Two has to do with energy. The data centers are consuming so much energy that Google is actually registered as a energy producer. In other words, you know, they, can, they can sell, they can be, they can operate a power plant and sell power to other people, except they have no interest in selling their power to anyone because they will use every single joule out of you know, what you, they generate. You know, that's, that's where things are headed right now. Um, so I, I think all of this is interesting, you know, particularly because in this class, we talk about the very fundamental stuff that you need to understand in order to design chips. And right now, there's a, there's a, you know, the, the chip design and the chip manufacturing industry is hot because that's what, you know, is what, that's what, that's part of the limitation of, you know, whether you can even have a startup company. Well, you can hire the right people, but if you don't get the chips and you don't get a data center, you don't get the computational power to train, you know, a model, there's nothing you can do. So, um, Interesting stuff, okay? We are living in a very interesting era. Things are progressing much faster than the past you know, few decades. So I think uh, I'm about to retire, so I don't have to deal with this.
<laughs> I know you guys don't want to hear that. It's like, oh, no, my professor is, is exiting, and I'm just getting into the whole thing. Yep. But I think if you guys kind of keep an eye on all of these things, you know, and just try to improve your problem-solving skills, okay, I think you know, you will still be okay. The one thing that AI cannot do is innovation, and then the other one is problem solving. You can it, it can emulate problem solving if it has seen a lot of articles of solving that particular problem, but for anything that is new that has never been written before, AI sometimes will have a, a really hard problem with those things. Um, so I'm going to stop the lecture and stop the recording. So this is where we stop today. We'll pick this up from next Monday. Okay, stop recording.